Bailey Kowalczyk, welcome to the podcast. Nice to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Nice to see you too. I'm so glad to be here. I should have said nice to meet you. I mean, I don't think we've ever really spoken at any length. Uh, and I've been eagerly awaiting to, you know, to have the opportunity to have you on the podcast. But really, this is the first time that we'll have a real conversation. And you're, of course, coming off a fantastic fifth place finish at the Golden Trail World Series final in Madeira. Fantastic performance. I was so happy to see you put together that amazing week of racing. So we'll maybe talk in more detail about this later, but just to tease it, I mean, how are you feeling about that awesome performance and and how do you think it maybe uh, impacts your, the future of what your goals are in the sport? Yeah. Well, first of all, nice to finally meet you too. It's so great. (laughs) So great to, to put a um, personality with the Instagram and the infamous podcast that I always listen to. Um, And I am just so happy. I'm over the moon about how Golden Trail Series and just this the season went this year. I'm it really went better than I could have ever imagined, and I'm just so grateful for my body and so grateful for health and and just the ability to be out there and race and and put it all out there. So, um, as far as what that leads to in the future, um, I think time will tell. But I'm definitely making big goals and I'm shooting for the stars and, and never saying never, I guess I, that's, that's the promise to myself is that I'm not, I'm not putting a cap on my goals. Love it. No, the future is so bright and we'll talk more about the future and the present later on in the conversation, but let's start with the past. Again, this is our first time really meeting each other. And I don't know that much about you. Typically I know more about like the personal story of the guests on the podcast, but I have to say I, you're sort of a mystery to me. So let's uh, go in the time machine and bring us back. Tell us about your background, your history with sport. Give us sort of the two minute version of your life story. Awesome. Well, I love being in a mystery, but I'm also an open book. So um, I actually started running at a very young age in elementary school, middle school, I started competing on the the varsity track team as a middle schooler. And then I took the classic approach to running, ran all three seasons through high school and into college. I ran at Clemson University in South Carolina. And unfortunately, after about two years, I burnt out pretty intensely. It was a really toxic environment. And I know that this story is, is a bit similar to other, um, trail runners and other runners in, in general. And, um, I ended up transferring schools for multiple reasons for my health, for my well um, for my relationship with running in general. So I, I took two years off of running competitively and running seriously at all. And then I slowly found my way back to running by living in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I, I graduated from CU Boulder and started training out here with just the local track club. And one thing led to another. I found my way on the trails quite quickly. And I I honestly haven't looked back since then. Um, The trails have been a pretty recent discovery. It's only been, um, I I discovered trails in 2019, but then I didn't start really competing until 2021 because of obvious COVID reasons and some injury um, and illness in there. But yeah, so it's been a whirlwind since I discovered the trails and and it's been amazing and I'm just so happy to be here. You found your home. Did you grow up in the South? I'm curious how you ended up at Clemson. Good question. I did not grow up in the South. I grew up in upstate New York, um, close to the Adirondack Mountains. And I really wanted to run for a big high level program. And for me, that meant a school on the East Coast. It just, it's that's where the funnel led me. And, um, the, the ACC was really enticing. So I was looking at schools like UNC Chapel Hill and Clemson, mm-hmm. and it, it was kind of a closed minded search, but in hindsight, I think I, I probably would have headed out West a little bit earlier, but mm-hmm. hindsight's 2020. So, <laughs> and so you transferred to CU Boulder and that's what brought you to Boulder where you reside now with some perspective, I guess it's been a few years at least since you've lived there. How did that move influence the trajectory that your running career has taken, which has obviously been off the road and tracks and onto the trail? Yeah, I, so I moved to Boulder in 2015. So it's been quite a while. And 
I'd say it completely redefined my relationship with running, my relationship with the outdoors, just myself. And it really, I don't, I think if I didn't move to Boulder, I would not be where I am right now. So Boulder is so special to me. I, it just means so much. I, I feel like I can be my realist self there. And it's, it's also brought me so much joy and, and so much passion for the sport that I've had quite a messy history with. So maybe we'll talk about that here in a sec too, because I know you've been through a few different life cycles with the sport as a lot of athletes have, but I'd love to maybe go back to what you mentioned about Clemson and maybe not having a positive experience with your collegiate system. It's funny. I'm just remembering, I talked about this with Danny Moreno on the podcast, I don't know, a couple of months ago now. And I feel like it's a recurring theme with trail runners specifically that they don't have a positive experience in their collegiate track environment or cross country environment. I'm wondering if you can put your finger on what led to that unfortunate situation and maybe with some hindsight, what you find in the trail community that's different. Yeah. Yeah. I feel what led to the situation. I, I had some really bad experiences with coaching staff. Um, in particular, I, I don't feel like the leadership that we had was very healthy and the environment that was created for our team was not, it just wasn't a great healthy environment. We were encouraged to lose weight, to perform better. And, um, it was all about what we looked like and, um, thin equaled fast and thin equaled successful. And for most, if not all humans, when you try to manipulate your genetics and manipulate what your body is supposed to look like and how it's supposed to function, it doesn't end well, but Mm -hmm. being 17 years old, um, I was, and I, I'm a, I'm a really big people pleaser. I want to trust authority and, and being, in that vulnerable position, I, I went down that road and really wanted to be the best runner that I possibly could be. So I um, tried to manipulate variables and tried to change what I looked like in order to be better. And so I think that this is kind of a systemic issue. It's um, There's still such a big culture of thin equals fast. And, mm-hmm. and that's kind of the wall that needs to be broken down. And that was something that was dictated from the coaching staff and not necessarily something that was a felt as peer pressure. Is that right? I think it was a little bit of both, but there was a conversation that I can recall where I was sitting in a coach's office and I was told that if I lose X amount of weight, um, then I will be able to go to NCAAs. I will be the athlete that they want, that I want the, the most successful version of me possible. And that while I, I laughed it off in the moment, I think that sat pretty heavily with me because it became this cycle of if I do more and more and more, and if I weigh less and less and less, then I will be the best Bailey possible. And yeah. that's just not true. I've heard a lot of people talk about that. One conversation that comes to mind is Ryan Hall and that leading to his early retirement and that his weight became a fixation. And I figure we get to this at some point, we might as well just kind of dive into this topic now because I think it's an important one where you can have a powerful voice. And one of the things that people I think really admire about you is that you have been a vocal advocate for women's health topics, fueling body image stuff. Was that born from this experience at Clemson? Yes, I would say that was 100% born from this experience, but also what this experience brought up in me. I think it was a perfect storm. I don't blame one instance for everything that happened to me. I think my genetics and my own makeup um, also made me more vulnerable for everything that I experienced. However, this this particular instance has motivated me to um, speak out and to be an advocate for this. And also to be, it's, it motivated me to be a coach, the coach that I felt like I did not have in my formative years. And so it's definitely led me down a lot of different paths that I don't think I would have followed if I hadn't have been through that. 
I'd love to hear more about how this has evolved for you over time. You know, after leaving your collegiate program, were you able to establish maybe a healthier relationship with body image subjects or, you know, eating and food and fueling in general? Yeah. So it, it's been a tough journey. Um, when I left Clemson, I was, I was actually medically removed. I'm, I'm going to be completely straightforward here. I was medically removed from Clemson because I was not healthy. I was, I was very unhealthy. And, um, when I came to Colorado, I was in a better place but I had lost the one thing that I had been really passionate about my whole life. And that was running. And so I kind of had to redefine that relationship with running relationship with my body and um, with sport and with not competing. And so it was this huge loss for me, but also trying to find my way. Um, Mm -hmm. And I felt like I did a, a reasonably good job of that, but it definitely, it's been a journey. It it's hard to just, erase the past and it's hard to create a better relationship with yourself when you are losing things that mean so much to you. And so it took years, I'd say. And I think bringing running back in my life helped me find a better relationship with myself um, in the process. Well, thanks so much for sharing it. I'm wondering if you could maybe share some resources that have been helpful in this journey obviously like i'm thinking about amelia boone and what a powerful voice she has been on the topic and sharing like the hardest details of her journey i wondered maybe other than her if there are other good resources for people and our listeners to develop a better understanding of the topic or a better relationship with themselves and their bodies yeah yeah amelia boone is amazing she's a good friend of mine um I'd say outside of Instagram, first of all, what was game changing for me was working with a, I work with a sports psychologist that specializes in eating disorder recovery. And she Mm. has been amazing. I think I know that it's not a resource that's um, viable for everybody because it is financially taxing, but it, it's been so worth it for me and and any therapist, honestly, any therapist that has eating disorder training and has awareness of this Mm. kind of world is great. Uh, Mine just happens to be specifically trained in athletes with eating disorders. So that was, that was really helpful for me because she helped me kind of tease apart athlete Bailey and then what I have going for me outside of that. And, And I don't need to be defined by running and I can come back to running as a healthy individual. And have the best races of my life, um, Mm. taking myself less seriously. So that has been a huge resource. I think, um, there's a lot of Instagram accounts. There's a lot of people like Amelia, like Tim that are sharing their stories and, Mm. and it's becoming more and more common. And I, I really appreciate people being open and honest in that sense. Um, but I would say, yeah, I would say therapy for me has been the biggest. There are some books and I, ca- I therapy's can't Therapy's amazing, isn't therapy's it? Therapy's the best. I, I feel like that's my answer for everything. But yeah, I read a few books, but at the end of the day, talking to people and and honestly, something that really, really helped me was being vulnerable with the community, with the running community, yeah. being honest about my story and telling my story and realizing that there's other people that are going through this and and we can support each other and build each other up and Um, that's what I love so much about the trail community is that I feel like I know all of these people and I've never actually met them, but they're supportive and loving and they want what's best for me and I want what's best for them. And, and, um, that's been really amazing. I love it. Well, thank you so much for sharing that Bailey. And I'm somebody who doesn't come from that collegiate track and cross country background, but I know there's a lot of men and women who've experienced what you have also, but I I am a big guy, you know, I'm six foot three. And sometimes I have the insecurity when I line up against people with bodies that you would traditionally associate with being like ideal for performance. And like I mentioned, you know, there's just this film that came out with Tim Tollefson where he Mm -hmm. talks about his journey with this body image stuff. And it's super common. So it's great to have leaders like you and Tim and Amelia um, out there in the community talking about it. So back to your, your story, you live in Boulder. I'm wondering if maybe 
when you're moving sort of from, when you're sort of developing this new healthy relationship with yourself and finding the love of running and love of the trails again, who were some of the people or what were the, some of the things that kept you inspired and, you know, when did it sort of the competitive instinct turn back on? Yeah. So I, I skipped a little bit in there. I start, when I started running again, I was on the roads and that, because that's all I knew at the time. So I started training on the roads and, and I'm sure you're familiar with Andy Wacker. Oh, yeah. He was my coach at the time. He was a good friend of mine. And so I felt like I kind of tiptoed my way back to the sport. First, I started training just as, um, just to provide people with a training partner. And I, I really just wanted to start running again and seeing what would happen. And then I would join in on some local track meets and some local road races. And slowly, I just felt like that itch was coming back and, and the desire to compete. And, and what that meant at the time was road and track um, competitions. But Andy is a hybrid road trail athlete. And so during our, our base building season, he I say forced us to get on the trails, but he, he pushed us towards the trails. And honestly, I immediately fell in love. It was, I think within two weeks that I was signed up for my first trail race. And it was just a whirlwind from there. I never really looked back. Um, and so the fire was lit so fast that there was, there was no turning back at that point. Does it make sense in hindsight growing up in upstate New York near the Adirondacks people who haven't been there don't really appreciate I think that it's like fairly far away and remote and wild with some really cool outdoor access when people think about New York they think about Manhattan and New York City but I'm wondering if maybe uh, what were your relationship what was your relationship with the outdoors as a little girl like now with some perspective do you see does it make sense that you've ended up in this community Yes. It, it makes so much sense. Honestly, I spent most of my childhood outside and my dad, my whole family is super outdoorsy, but my dad in particular would send himself down. So we would hike up mountains and then he would just run down. And so in order to catch up to him, I had to run down. And I, I honestly feel like all of that chasing him down these in, in the Adirondacks, the trails are weirdly technical in yeah like super awkward ways. And so I felt like I developed this sense of my body and an ability to run downhill smoothly um, at a really young age, just following him and being in the mountains and spending so much time on trails. I, I really have always loved the outdoors, which is funny that I ended up in South Carolina because we really didn't have any trails near, near the school. But um, yeah, I think it all makes sense now. And, and my parents would agree with that, that I, I spent most of my childhood rolling in dirt and running up and down mountains. And so no, none of this is very surprising. Yeah. So eventually it seems like you're working with Andy Wacker. He sort of introduces you to the trails. You're doing it as base building and then it gets a little bit more serious. Can you talk about that transition? Yeah. So I ran, I ran a hill climb in um, I think it was Breckenridge and that I ended up winning that and I don't think it was competitive or anything, but it was just so exciting to feel like I could be competitive again and, and enjoy it. And I really, I had such a great time, but I also craved the downhill. So I was like, I need to do this again. I need to run up and down. So then I, um, just like my pops, just like your old man, Yeah, <laughs> like, where's the downhill guys. So I ended up signing up for the bar trail mountain race, which is, half of Pikes Peak. So you run to the bar camp uh, and then back down. So it's half marathon, which was way outside of my distance comfort zone. Um, but I figured that it was a good, a good starting point. Andy said it was a great race. So I took his, um, wisdom there and I got second there, but it was a very dramatic second. Um, I ended up feeling this pain in my back about halfway up the climb. And I was like, well, maybe this is trail running. Maybe it's supposed to be this painful. And, uh, when I turned around to run downhill, my, every time I sped up, my leg gave out and I would fall. And so I ended up finishing needing 25 stitches on my knees and I had fully broken my sacrum. Um, 
And Jeez. that was unfortunately an injury that I came in with that I didn't know existed. Um, but, and a reflection of, of my past and the way that I treated my body. And so mm. I think that was just a big reminder that, you know, like my history is not something that is just going to go away and I need to treat myself well. And, um, so that was kind of a knock because it was so early in my trail career and I was so excited to get started and, and I just got literally and figuratively thrown on my face. Yeah. And, but eventually you bounce back and sort of, at what point did you think to yourself, like the trails are sort of my home and this is where I want to pursue my professional career as an athlete? Yeah, I, I competed once more that year, right when I came back, um, like a month after I did my return to run, I competed in the Spartan Spartan had like a trail running world championship event in California that year. Mm -hmm. And I won that and was just so excited by the community. And I was reassured that this is my place. And mm -hmm. it was so early on, but I, I really felt confident that I could do this thing. And, and mm -hmm. that's when, that's actually when Solomon reached out to me. And that's when I decided that I was just going to jump in head first. And for context, this is just a couple of years ago, right? It was just like, 2019 this was late 2019 um so i signed my first year with solomon was 2020 and obviously nothing really happened that year. <laughs> COVID, yeah. so i had a really underwhelming start to the to trail running but that's i think that was really important i i went for a lot of fkts in 2020 i really found my place individually in the sport before yeah. um competitively yeah so it's only been a couple of years and here you are top five at the golden trail world series. It's a pretty remarkable progression. And we'll talk more about 2020, those FKTs and what you've done in recent years. But before we get to it as a younger pro on the scene, who's really coming into your own, I'd love your perspective on the sport right now. Like things that drew you to the community, kind of what keeps you here. And, and also maybe, where do you think there's reason to be concerned? This is me as a, an old man looking to understand the next generation. So I, I'd love to just kind of understand like how you and people like you, your generation, sort of mid to late twenties coming up as professional athletes in the sport, how you guys are thinking about it. Yeah. So the reason I love the trail world is that I feel like while the competition is hot, it's not cutthroat and it doesn't it feels like at the end of the day it's one giant family even though we're all racing for ourselves in the moment um like for example golden trail it it felt like a giant party like it was like everybody is super happy and super stoked to be there but then when you're racing you're racing and you're you're putting your all out there for yourself and for i mean everybody has a different reason that they're racing but it really, there was a lot, there's a lot more camaraderie than I felt in the road world. And I still do love to get on roads every now and then, but it's just not the same vibe when you're on the start line and, and just the community in general, I, I, it fills my cup so much and everybody is really just so passionate and they're all, it feels like there's so many students of the sport. People want to learn from each other. People want to, to build relationships and, and that's really cool to me. So that's, that's kind of what keeps me in the trail world. Um, some, some places that I think that there could be improvement is obviously the, um, there's still just that, that culture of thinner is better. And, and unfortunately that's in every running sport right now. And I'm sure other sports and that's both women and men. It, I do feel like it's a little bit more prevalent in women. Um, and that's something I'm really trying to knock down and really trying to work on personally, because I, I mean, I can personally attest to the fact that running in your healthiest body is going to get you to your goals a heck of a lot faster than trying to fight your body. Um, mm -hmm. that's, and I can get to that later, but that's kind of how my year has gone. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other thing that I think is interesting that the road world definitely has figured out is, um, drug testing. I think there's a lot more standardized drug testing in the road world. And oh, yeah. uh, maybe that's just a financial thing and, and it'll come. Um, but I think that the competition is getting so 
intense in the trail yeah. world that it's something that that should follow the competition to make sure that everybody's on an even playing field. What about on the competition side of things? I'm thinking about things like the Golden Trail Series. You know, I started in the sport when I was younger than you, you know, when I was in my early 20s. And at that time, most of the competitive opportunities were in ultra marathons, right? And now there's this thriving world of sub ultra races, oftentimes led by things like the Golden Trail World Series. Curious how you're thinking about that in terms of career, you know, trajectory and also, you know, if beyond yourself, like other younger athletes in the sport, how you're thinking about sort of the longer term arc of your career. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, for right now, it's really exciting that there's been more of a focus on the sub ultras. Um, I think when I originally said I was going to trail running, I know my parents were like, you're not going to run 200 miles at a time. Right. (laughs) So I think there's such a, that's just such a big part of the culture. I mean, you see Western States, hard rock, like everybody knows these giant long ultras and it's definitely cool that, that the sub ultras are getting a little bit more love right now because that's, that's where my heart is right now. Um, like I said, I'll never say never. So I can't say that I won't show up to a ultra start line in the future, but, um, at least for the next few years of the foreseeable future, I, I plan on staying in the, I'd say like two to six hour range. I say Mm -hmm. six hour range because OCC definitely intrigues me, Uh, (laughs) but that's about as long as I'd go right now. Heck yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's an awesome new development and a lot of it is, you know, the credit is, is due to the golden trail series and also like the Cirque series and all the like trail and mountain running world championships over the weekend was awesome, which also had a lot of great sub ultra distance racing. And I think for someone like you, who, what are you like 27 right now? Yeah. 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 So with the world ahead of you, I think it is just a, a great new development that will allow athletes to have a r- really long relationship with the sport and hopefully really long professional careers in the sport where you don't feel that pressure of like, oh, I got to go around a hundred miler in order to keep my sponsors, but instead do what motivates you, do what keeps you inspired. And I think that's really fun. So let's get back to more racing stuff in a sec, but the first time I heard your name, I think, was when you broke the FKT or the Strava CR on Mount Table Pius. And I wanted to ask you about this because we just released a little video about Mount Tam today. It's a place that holds a special place in my heart. And uh, I think it was a, actually like a fairly big moment for you in your trail running career to take that FKT in the middle of COVID. Can you just talk about that experience? Yeah. Yeah. So like I mentioned earlier, I, I spent most of 2020 kind of chasing FKTs, um, cause like many other athletes, it was just such a tough time for competition. And, and I felt like I was testing myself, but also seeing where I stood in the, in the trail world because I hadn't competed much. Um, my partner, his family lives out in the East Bay area. So we spend at least, about a month every winter coming out here so that we can keep our trail legs happy. Um, and usually we stick to Mount Diablo, which is more on his side of the Bay, but I had been super intrigued by Mount Tam. I had seen that Jim Walmsley put up a really good time and it seemed like there were a lot of people that were going back and forth. And I had, I had a friend that lived in the Marin area and she said that she thought that I could get it. And Um, there were a lot of people that were saying that it was just such a fun climb. So I went out there and I attempted to scout it one day. And, um, I'm going to be completely honest. I am one of the biggest navigational nightmares that you'll probably ever. Mount Tam is tricky. Mount Tam's tricky. That's why when Jim came and absolutely destroyed it, we were all so bummed out because we were banking on a navigational error thwarting him. But yeah, it's super awkward. It's, I think, so I took a wrong turn before I even got to the trail. I was in the neighborhood just circling for hours, but it wasn't really hours, but it, um, so then the next day I ended up going for it and I had some, some people pointing me in the right direction, which was helpful because, 
um, that scramble at the top can be a little challenging, but man, it was so fun and it hurt so badly. It, it felt like I really put, put everything out there that I had that day. And, um, it's, I think it's short enough that you can completely redline the whole time. And that was just so fun. I had such a good time and I felt so much, I just felt so full after that. And so validated that this is where I belong. And this, and in the community that, that kind of responded to that was just amazing. And yeah, I think it just lit the fire all over again, which was really fun. Yeah. So good. And speaking of scouting, just for the listening audience, it's a fairly entertaining story. When Jim broke the FKT on Mount Tam, he summited, he ran the whole route all the way to the summit and then ran back down and then time trialed it after he'd already <laughs> done a lap on a mountain and destroyed the record. It's like 30 minutes flat almost. And very casual, Jim. <laughs> yeah, very casual, Jim, just double summiting and breaking the record on the second summit. But well, I can assure you, I did not do that. Yeah. And, and it is, I mean, this is inside baseball probably that doesn't it's not interesting to a lot of people, but Mount Tam is a great test piece in the Bay area mountain that people like to run up really hard. Like you said, you can red line the whole way. So it's a good place to come suffer, but let's get back to your season. Um, this has been an amazing year for you, but it, you sort of had a late start. And so I wondered what that was about, you know, cause I don't think you really raced until like July, And uh, maybe with some perspective, like if you feel like that late start maybe contributed to this amazing last four or five months you've had. Yeah. So I, I started racing in the first week of August and it was a very, I would say compact and busy season. Um, There were there, I mean, there's one major reason that I didn't start until later on. And that is that I actually relapsed um, with the eating disorder. And that was, Honestly, it it was really tough. I, I did not, you know, I thought I had put my past behind me. I thought that I had kind of closed that door and I could just let my guard down a little bit and forget about it. And I, I got kind of sucked back into that. Um, in 2021, that was my first real schedule, basically my first time racing a full season. Mm -hmm. And I found myself on every U S podium that I raced in, but I, I wasn't on the top of those podiums. And so I was like, what's going to get me that 1% better. And unfortunately, like I said, my, the way that my brain works, um, is that it works against me sometimes. And Mm -hmm. there was a lot of negative self-talk happening and a lot of voices telling me, well, what's the difference between you and the person in first place? Well, Mm -hmm. it's that you don't look like a runner. You don't, you're too big. You're not fast enough because you have X, Y, and Z. It's not, it's not the details that matter as much as the fact that I, I really gave into those voices. And, um, I had a really, really rough start to the year. I, I got myself in a really unhealthy position and I was very ashamed. I, I kind of hid from the community for a bit and, um, dropped off the face of the earth in a way I ended up taking two months off of running. And I think that saved me mentally. It saved me physically. Um, Mm -hmm. I came back with so much gratitude and honestly, I, I almost feel like my first recovery was fake in a way. And, and I say that because I just feel so authentic right now and so much different. And I feel so much more connected to the community and there's a level of, um, like, I, I just feel like I, I, my most authentic self right now. And, um, I think that gratitude brought me through the entire season and will carry me even further. Can we stay here for a sec? I'd love to here if you don't mind and I hope this isn't weird like what recovery actually means like did you get back in therapy and work in that way and also what are some of the practical things that you do day to day when you don't have the support of the therapist around to like ensure that you're staying true to yourself and to the values that you want to live by 
Yeah, these are great questions because I feel like when I listen to people's stories, like these are the things that are never really mentioned, like the the dirty details, essentially, the things that nobody really wants to deal with, but everybody should hear. Yeah. Um, and what it looked like for me, and I know everybody's story is different, but I... I, I mean, there were multiple interventions that that I didn't just decide I'm going to take eight weeks off of running. This is a good idea. I was I was very in denial. Um, however, I have an amazing team that um, brought brought up a lot of concerns, and I started seeing my therapist every week. I started seeing a sports dietitian every week, um, and then I was checking in with my coach every day. So there was a lot of accountability there. Um, it was not every day though. So it came down to me to make those day-to-day decisions. I was seeing my therapist, I think I would say like my therapist on a Tuesday and the dietitian on a Thursday. So there was a little bit of like staggered accountability. Um, but the first few weeks after my, I would say like come to Jesus talk with them, the yeah. first few weeks, I felt like nothing really changed except for taking running away because I was just mad. I was mad at the world. I was mad at myself. I was mad at my body. Mm. I was, I was mad at the people around me for taking me out of the sport. I was, I was mad that they were in my mind at the time they were sabotaging my career. It all felt like this huge letdown in so many different ways. And, but then. So it was kind of an intervention though, where they said you need to stop running. Yes, it was an intervention. Um, and I mean, there was a level of me that was concerned for my own health at that time. And that, and that came to play. I, I had to be really honest with my coach because I had been lying about just how bad things were. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was a big level of myself acknowledging that there was a problem, but also kind of underplaying how big the problem was. Um, and so that's where the, the intervention was more you can't train through recovery right now. I Mm. thought like, okay, I can, I can increase my support team. I can go through recovery, but I can keep running at a professional level and at the highest level and at the current mileage that I'm at, which was like 80 miles a week at the time on trails. Um, and that part, they were like, no, this is not your, that'll be like, you know, a fake recovery, essentially. Like I'm not going to be able to fully be my healthiest self if I'm trying to do all of that while getting my body in the right spot. And so, um, that I feel like two, about two weeks after I stopped running was when I had a bit of an F you moment with the eating disorder. And I was like, you know, this is stupid. Like it's taken so much from me. And I, (laughs) the thought process initially was, this is going to make me 1% better. And I'm here walking in my neighborhood and calling this exercise and calling this training like this is so dumb and and this illness is so backwards and so you know this is like my public service announcement to anybody listening to those voices right now it's like just just fact check quickly like is this bringing you closer to your goals um and that was that was my big like f you moment that i can remember the day i I, that's the day that I started challenging myself more, um, just with food and, and being more open to being uncomfortable. I mean, none of this is comfortable. You're, you're basically force feeding yourself, um, a lot of food, Yeah. And, you know, it's, it feels bad for a while. It feels yeah. really gross and, and not natural, but then I don't know. It's just, I, the more, fueled my brain was, the more fueled my body was, the more motivated I was to get the heck back out there. And, wow. and that's exactly what happened. Wow. Well, thank you again for sharing that. That's really amazing. I didn't think we'd come back to that subject and you yeah, use the word relapse. And I know it's not uncommon for people to struggle with this over many years and feel like they have it under control and then come back to it much like alcoholism or any sort of addiction, but it feels like, you know, oftentimes when you go through hard things and you come through the other side, you sort of have this renewed energy and enthusiasm for what you're doing. And it feels like that maybe that springboarded you into the last five months that you've had as an athlete, which has been incredible. Do you attribute 
this season more to the attitude component or the physical health, or is it a mixture of both? I think it's a bit of a mixture of both. I think the, I think running, taking myself less seriously has been really important this year. Um, running on gratitude. I think both of those things are very important for my own longevity in the sport. You mean, as opposed Um, to like for race results and validation, you know, in the media or whatever. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is just, you know, like not like being okay with where I am and not comparing myself to everybody next to me and being like, well, that's going to make me better. That's going to make me better. Like writing my own story. Um, I think last year I just got so caught up in how I could be more like that person instead of like, how can I be the best version of myself? Wow. And so that's been something that's been game changing this year is just like, I'm writing my own book and whatever happens happens. And, and that just, that worked so well this year. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's talk specifically about the races that you've done. You started the season at the Strand of Fjord Golden Trail Race. You were eighth there. So maybe let's just glance over that and move to Sierras and All, where you were sixth place in Top American at what is one of the most important races in all of the European continent. It felt like, to me, a major breakthrough. And I remember sending you a message after the race, just like, wow, congratulations. That is a heck of an accomplishment. What did that result at Sierras and all mean to you? Well, I do also remember your message because I was like, I made it. This is great. (laughs) (laughs) This is it. Um, But really, honestly, that was, that result meant everything. I think it reminded me of why I, why I'm here, why I'm healthy, what being healthy can do for you, what doors it can open. I, I honestly, the entire race, I felt like I was floating. Like it it truly was this magical experience where everything came together. I felt fast and strong and capable. And, um, I never in my wildest dreams, I remember so many people telling me that Sears and all takes so many tries to, to even, um, get in the top 10. And so it's something that I do not take for granted at all. I'm so mm-hmm. happy with how I finished there and and I'm obviously hungry for more, but it's, it was just such a happy moment for me. Um, and, and yeah, I think it was, it was kind of the moment this year where I was like, wow, this, this season could be game changing. It could be like really revolutionary for me. Was there a moment of reflection, not to keep going back to this, but maybe with your coach and your therapist after that accomplishment to think like, I'm actually on the right track now? Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, both of them were just ecstatic and and like, you know, I had no expectations going into this season. Like my goal was just to show up to a start line healthy. Mm -hmm. And so to, to show up to not only a start line, but this start line and come away with that result, they were like, wow, this is this is just validation that, you know, like you don't need to be what those voices tell you, you should be, you know, you don't need to be thinner in order to be the best. Um, and, and like, obviously this is, I would say that's one of the best results I've had in my life. And I was in the healthiest body that I've had. Um, and so that that's just so exciting to me. Awesome. So you did some other stuff, but let's fast forward to the Golden Trail World Series, which was just a couple weeks ago. But in between, you won the rut 28K, smashed it. You're in the top 10 overall. Seventh at the Pikes, Pikes Peak Ascent, also Golden Trail. Ninth at Flagstaff, Sky Peaks, Golden Trail. I understand that wasn't a perfect race, but another awesome top 10 on the world's biggest stage against the best athletes. And that sent you to Madeira, an amazing tiny island off the coast of Africa, (laughs) Portuguese (laughs) territory. And from what I understand, I've never been there, a trail running paradise. And uh, it was five day competition against some of the best athletes in the world. Um, And before we go into maybe the details of the race, I'd love to just hear you as a professional on the scene talk about the experience of being a pro racing on the golden trail world series, world series, just cause I am such an admirer of what they do for the sport and especially for the pros. So I'm sure the listeners would love to 
get an idea after watching all the great live streams and content that they produce, what it's like to be on the other side as an athlete? Yeah, I, I'm so grateful for golden trail. I feel like they've really helped me, um, blossom in the sport or start to blossom. I don't feel like I've, I've fully developed in the sport, which is super fun, but they, they have just such a great media team that really captures the event so well. Um, and then also they just bring such a great, such a high level of competition. There are so many big names that race, Um, and I think part of that is that they put a lot of money into these events. Um, but I have always wanted to throw myself headfirst into the biggest events. I'm, I'm not really, I don't know. I, I want to run races that inspire me, but also that bring the best of the best. And that's okay that I'm not on the podium. I'd rather test myself with the best of the best than, um, than just win, races that don't inspire me as much. I mean, I'm, I think that's worth emphasizing, you know, like in a lot of the, even the UTMB world series races, you know, it's not, I don't want to say easy, but like the density of competition in the golden trail series is unlike anything else. And so if you finish six, that's yours and all that's like winning most other races in the world, if you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it is, it's funny because you know, my goal last year was like, I want one top 10 finish in a golden trail race. Like that would be amazing. And it's, it's hard to describe to people in the U S sometimes because you have 20 girls racing for the top three and they all could get top three, like any one of them on that day. So it's pretty cool. Um, but it's also, it's just crazy. It's such a high level competition. So to get top 10 and every race this year that I ran that was golden trail is like not lost on me at all. Yeah. So being young and probably less experienced than most of the athletes who are at Madeira and on the golden trail series in general, are there any training or lifestyle habits that you've learned from some of the European counterparts that have influenced your own approach to the sport? Um, I think, Something that a lot of Europeans have inspired me to look into more is ski mo, ski mountaineering. Um, I so I grew up. I started skiing when I was two years old, so right around the same time that I started walking. But um, that was all downhill skiing. So we would ride the chairlift and ski down, or I did some backcountry with my dad, but never anything for training. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these European athletes are just monsters at power hiking. And I I really wanted to know why. So I talked to a few people and it seems like the majority of the Europeans spend their winters either ski mountaineering or Nordic skiing, but skiing is usually involved and running is usually on the back burner. Whereas I've always just run year round. um, and, And I don't think there's a problem with that, but I do want to try to incorporate more skiing this year. I think that that's something that, um, could really just be an interesting variable to throw into there. Um, Mm -hmm. and then I think that's the biggest takeaway. There's, there's some lifestyle. Yeah. Like professionalism, lifestyle stuff. I'd, I'd love to hear about that because I don't know, Europeans definitely do have a different culture when it comes to endurance sport. It's a little bit more baked into their greater national sporting cultures in a lot of cases than it is for American athletes. Is there anything there just in terms of like, as a young up and coming professional learning from people who maybe come from a more professional sporting background? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting because it's not something that came naturally to me. Like running professionally didn't seem, I mean, I always pictured myself running professionally on the roads, but never in this trail world. And so I think right now, like there's no specific thing that I can point to with the Europeans. It's more just, I, I just like to soak up their wisdom. Like they all have a lot of different pieces of advice and, and nothing in particular, um, that stands out to me. It's more just, it's, it's so natural to them. So I feel like just being around them, I I just feel like a sponge and, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's awesome. And the Americans 
man, we are showing up too on the Golden Trail series. I mean, between yourself and Sophia and Sophia Lockley and Danny Moreno and the Hemmings. I mean, you yeah, got- it's been such a cool year. Um, because last year, last year I did my first few real Golden Trail races, but I didn't do the whole series. And they're really, I was like usually one of two Americans, one of two or three. And so that's been super cool is that there were so many Americans and so many Americans crushing it. Um, yeah. So that was, that was really fun. And I hope that that's the case. I hope that we can kind of make this sport bigger in the U S and, yeah. and make it so that, you know, our children someday are, are like the Europeans where it's ingrained in them. It's, it's natural to be talking about professional um, athletics and professional trail running. And yeah, that's really exciting. Yeah, I hope they, you know, with the double stop with Pike Peak Ascent and the Flagstaff Sky Peaks, I'm hoping they'll have another North American stop on the circuit next year. They'll probably be announcing that fairly soon. But yeah, the the plan is to do it similarly, is to okay. do two back to back U.S. races again next year. So that's exciting, and I think it'll bring more U.S. people too. Amazing. All right, so let's talk about your stage race specifically. We don't need to go through every day, but I'd love to hear you talk about stage two, because like Sears and all that felt like an absolute breakthrough for you of like Bailey can compete against the best in the world. You were second behind Ninka Brinkman, who's of course an absolute star and who won the series outright. Any uh, comments, reflections, anecdotes from stage two? Yeah. Stage two was honestly, it was the closest thing this year is and all that I could put my finger on. I, you know, I, every single stage I told myself, I'm just going to start and about half mile in, I'll assess how my body's doing and then go from there. Like I'm not, I can't judge the first half mile. It's going to take a second for my legs to like really feel good. And uh, about a half mile into that stage, I was like, wow, this feels really good. This feels very like Sears and all, like, I'm just going to take it moment by moment, but you can start just, just kind of pushing it a little bit. And that's exactly what I did. Um, and it just, it was another, it was kind of an out of body experience. It felt like I was like floating a bit. Um, I, yeah. I was picking girls off that I never thought that I could have even competed with. And and that was just amazing. The downhills felt super smooth. And I, I feel like I'm a, I'm a good downhill runner, but some days I just don't show up. Like my legs just don't want to do it. And so that was, it kind of all came together. Like it, it felt good to climb. It felt good to descend. And, and I was passing people on both. And um, so I just ran with it. I, I didn't really want to be tactical about all five days. I I wanted to capitalize on a day that was one dry because it was so wet there the, yeah. on day one. So I wanted to, to capitalize on a day that I knew that my strengths would suit me well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, I just went for it. And, and I was like, you know, if, if this kills my legs for tomorrow, I'm kind of, I'm okay with it because it's, it's going to be worth it. And it 150% was. Can you talk about management of, energy expenditure over a five day series. Cause I think that was fairly new for you. And I know that stage three, you were feeling the effects of your effort on stage two, but then you bounce back really strongly in stage four and five. how did you manage the strategy of energy expenditure? Yeah, it was, it, it's, this was so new to me. This is about as close to ultra running as I can get right now. <laughs> Um, stage three was technically like half points and it was short. And so my goal for stage three was just to, it was also really late in the day. So my goal there was just to, um, kind of coast through it, survive, not fully blow myself, um, especially after day two. And given that there weren't many points at stake because the whole golden trail series is based on points. Um, so my big goal was kind of recovery on that stage three and it ended up feeling absolutely awful. So it made me quite nervous for four and five, but honestly food was, was so important. Like I felt like it was very much a eating stage race, just Mm -hmm. as much as it was a racing stage race. Um, it seemed like you couldn't, eat too much food and you mean um, obviously I, during the racing and after before I'm talking yeah I'm talking mostly after but also during like for me 
it's always been challenging to follow the perfect fuel plan that I want during a race. And for these races, like more, more was more like, I just, I really just fueled as much as I possibly could and more so than I would during just one race. And if like, if I had 30 minutes left and it had been 30 minutes since I had my last gel, then I was taking another gel, even if I had 20 minutes left and I felt a little funky. Like it was, I mean, I think on day two, I had a gel with 10 minutes left to go. And and on a normal race, I wouldn't do that, but I knew that I had three more days left. So why not? It's not, it's not going to hurt me. It's just going to help with recovery. So, um, I think that that was, it was a big celebration, like not to go back to this too many times, but like, I didn't care about how much I was eating at all. Like this is yeah. to fuel the adventure and, and it really did. Yeah. And then of course you finish up with double fourth place finishes stage four, stage five. At what point did you realize that you were in contention for a top five finish here at the world final of the golden trail series? And uh, what was your psychology like during those last two stages, if there's any great stories or anecdotes from them, I'm sure the audience would love to hear. Yeah. So on day four, I didn't know that I was in contention for top five until after day four. Um, before day four, I just, I was trying not to focus too much on all the math and the nitty gritty. I did know that seventh, so I was in sixth Mm -hmm. and I knew that seventh could not catch me if I, as long as I, um, finished, I think it was like top 10 day four and she didn't win the race, which I, I did not think she would with the people that were showing up. Um, and so that was nice, but I didn't really think about the person in front of me on the fourth day that day. I I did the same exact plan half mile in. I was like, how are my legs feeling? Oh, wow. They feel good. Let's do this again. Um, and then on day five, it was kind of funky because I ended up 10 points behind the girl that was in fifth place. And I was like, wow, this could be really, really cool to finish top five, but also I'd be happy with six. I can't be greedy. Um, and so I told myself, like, I'm just going to do the same exact thing. Like, don't panic and try to win the race and because it was such a long race on the last day. And so I didn't want to you know, win the first mile and then just die this painful, slow death. Um, Mm -hmm. and it went out quite hot and I noticed like I was with the girl that was in, that was in, um, fifth at the time. And, and I just noticed I was thinking a bit too much about it. So I decided to just shut my brain off. I was like, okay, you know what, you need to run your race and your race only. Um, and it ended up working out and, um, Unfortunately, the girl that was in fifth, I do have to mention, she she broke her back on the first stage and she ended up racing all five stages. So massive kudos to her. Um, I I do know I earned my fifth place. However, I was just that that definitely hurts. Sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I raced my own race and and came out fifth. And that was one of the most I say I feel like I say that a lot this season, but it was one of the most exciting moments of my career so far. It was just so exciting. And, um, yeah, there were so many times in the race where I was like, Ooh, I'm not sure this is going to work out. I I had some cramps in the middle and, um, I took like way more fuel than I usually would. And it ended up being fine. So yeah. What a great lesson. So maybe to bring things full circle, I mean, have you had a chance to reflect on this year? I mean, that, which started in a way that seems to have been very difficult and now you're sort of finishing your season with what seems like a renewed understanding and love for yourself and a renewed love for the sport. Have you done any reflecting on that? I definitely have. Yeah. I, um, gosh, I'm just so happy with how it went and so excited for the future and so grateful. And honestly, I think, I don't know. I just think I say Bailey 3.0 is, is here to stay. Like, I think that that's, that's been the theme and, um, I just keep coming back to eternal gratitude and, um, it's, I'm kind of at a place where I'm like reflecting, but also getting super excited for next year. And, and so, you know, setting goals, I'm like, I'm just shooting big. Like, I'm just so excited to, 
there's so many opportunities out there. So it's also really hard to, to find the right things to do, but. Well, let's close on that subject and the vein of setting big goals and shooting for the stars and next year, tell us what 2023 looks like for you, both personally, athletically, professionally, all that stuff. Yeah. So, so far, uh, my goal is to do the golden trail series again. Um, but there's also some other things that excite me. So like I said, OCC excites me, but I think that might be a 2024 thing. I, I think that I really want to do Zegama. Zegama was on my list for this year. And it's one of the many races in the beginning of the year that I had to scratch from. Um, it was the first big race that I had to scratch from this year. So I think it would be really cool to go to Zegama and to really um, see what I can do there. It's another kind of like Sears and all like it's just such a big iconic race in Europe. Um, and then it would be really cool to do marathon du Mont Blanc because I did that in 2021. And, um, I just think I've grown so much since then. So it would be really yeah. cool to go back and, and see mostly just how it feels to be back there. And, and because I remember how it felt last time and I was like, just, wrecked from that course so it'd be really cool to go back and and to just see what my body can do there well bailey congratulations on what has been an amazing breakthrough season for you you've clearly arrived at the top of the sport and you still have a huge future ahead of you so i appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing your story thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it